I think the biggest thing that we need to realize is that really bad things can happen to us and we can improve exponentially how we live with them by knowing how to put them down and react in ways that are more effective. Hello and welcome to the Meta Hour podcast with Sharon Salzberg. I'm Lily Cushman. I produce this podcast. And today, Dr. Jenny Tates returns to the podcast. Jenny is a clinical psychologist. She is an author. She has a brand new book out, Stress Resets, How to Soothe Your Body and Mind in Minutes. And the first time she appeared on the Meta Hour was way back in 2018. So we're delighted to have her back. Jenny is also the founder of LA CBT DBT, which is a private therapy practice based in Los Angeles. She also sees clients in New York by telehealth. She's also an assistant clinical professor at the Department of Psychiatry at UCLA. And her writing has appeared in a lot of great publications, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. So it's a real treat to have her back on the podcast. And today's conversation is really looking at what happens when the body encounters stress and what's happening in the brain. And Jenny is very masterful at applying really practical techniques in order to kind of bring ourselves back when we get hijacked from stress. So there's a lot of great nuggets here to put into practice. She talks about acute stress versus chronic stress, as well as the distinction between trauma and stress, and how we can prevent what she calls a stress snowball, which sounds familiar. A lot of her work is about cultivating agency when we're dealing with stress not only in the moment so that we can really reset those peak moments of stress, but also how to build in stress buffers in our lives so that when we encounter stress, we can stay regulated for longer. So let's get to the interview, Dr. Jenny Tates and Sharon Salzberg. Hey, Jenny, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Sharon. It's such a treat to be back talking to you. Oh, it's really delightful to be together with you. Where are you right now? Where are you recording from? I am recording from my house in Los Angeles. Lovely. Certainly missing you in New York City. Ah, uh, yes. Well, I'm at the moment in Barry, Massachusetts, recording from my house, but uh, I've been recently in New York City, which is wonderful. It was such a treat when I lived there to be able to pop in on your different classes, whether downtown uh -huh. or uptown. Or... This is very cool. I loved seeing you wherever I went. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> so it's wonderful having you back on the podcast. The first time you were a guest on here was in 2018, which feels like a couple of lifetimes ago. It's wonderful to have you back. And for our listeners, uh, you can hear Jenny's first appearance on episode 78. And I want to offer a big congratulations on your new book, which will be available everywhere by the time this episode is released. The title is Stress Resets, How to Soothe Your Body and Mind in Minutes from a publisher that we actually share, which is Workman. Thank you. Oh, it's, it's so delightful. And I know it's a lot of work, so it's a really big accomplishment. So very sincere congratulations. Thank you. That means so much. So this is a quotation from the book about how stress is defined. Pioneer stress researcher, Dr. Hans Selye, an endocrinologist who began studying the topic close to 100 years ago, saw stress as an adaptive bodily response that pushes us to react when we're feeling overwhelmed. Dr. Selye, who published more than 1,700 articles related to stress, described it like this. External event leads to stress response. Decades later in the 1980s, Dr. Richard Lazarus, a clinical psychologist who focused on coping and problem solving, 
broaden the definition of stress to include how we react to it. Describing stress as an experience in which a challenge, interpretation, and reaction can all play a role. But whatever the equation, the takeaway is this. How you respond to what you're facing affects how stressed you ultimately feel. I noticed you have a stress calculator on your website. One thing I think is interesting to discuss about stress is how often people feel that their stress levels are direct correlates to what they see as the source of stress. So let's say it's a period of work where you have more on your plate. This idea that the stress around this will only lower once the time period ends and the work lessens. And so it's a very different approach to say, oh, I have a choice here about how I respond to this situation. It seems like there's an element of agency that seems like the foundation for your book. Yes, and you're the first person to notice the stress calculator on my website, so <laughs> thank you. Um, and I include that because I didn't write a book to make people scared of stress or be very theoretical talking about all the ways stress affects your body, but I wrote a book to actually improve your ability to cope with stress. And so I love giving, when I work with clients, I love to give them pre and post measures to see like, is their anxiety going down? Is their depression going down? Is their quality of life going up? And so too, I want people to, I, I take people's time very seriously and the opportunity to touch people very seriously. And I want people to be able to assess did reading stress resets improved my, improve my perceived stress? Um, and I think even just the title of the measure is so fascinating that a lot of stress has to do with our perception. Well, I've always thought of stress uh, as a dynamic. It's the dynamic interplay between, you know, the incident or the circumstance or the comment we overhear, whatever it is, and the way that we respond or the resource with which we respond. And that Resource can be inner strength. It can be a sense of community rather than aloneness. It can be so many different things. And sometimes people hear that kind of thing and interpret it to mean, well, that means you're not going to try to do anything about the actual circumstance, like that overload of work, for example. And I don't think it means that at all, but sort of like from my point of view, why try to make a change when you're already exhausted and feel depleted and overcome? You know, why not build up the things that will help you be coming from a better place? So I think there are certain things in life we would just categorize as stressful and just as common sense, you know. But these experiences, when they're less extreme, can be pretty subjective. Some people feel challenged. Other people feel overwhelmed. It's, it's pretty fascinating. And what might be considered just terribly stressful to one person may not be experienced in quite that way, in part because of that sense of resource. So do you think it, it comes down to a sense of inner resource or resilience? This is such an important question. And when it comes to managing stress, there's a lot to consider. One of the things that I want to start with is, so, so there's a difference between acute stress, which is something short-lived, versus chronic stress, which is ongoing. And mm -hmm. Remarkably, this is something that I found so fascinating in my research. You can have something that's a chronic stressor, let's say caregiving for a loved one that's struggling with health or a really stressful work environment that doesn't take a chronic toll on you that isn't an ongoing source of pain. And just, you could also have acute stressors on the flip side, things that are short lived and temporary that really come back to haunt you. You know, you could have something that happens for a couple of minutes during the workday that you're replaying and reliving for days afterwards, or if someone asks you to tell them about the most upsetting thing that happened to you, even if it happened decades ago, you can easily re-experience the full physiological effect. And so I think we all will create a heavy burden of stress, regardless of what we're facing, if we're not able to put stress down. And some people think that that's just not something that they have in them, but this is something that we can all learn to practice. And there are 
skills and tools to be able to increasingly put stress down, even if that's something that you haven't felt like you've been able to do. And then that lightens the the load and improves your bandwidth. And I think not only is it really malleable how we can cope with stress, but even the same person, depending on the day, could have a different bandwidth or different ability to cope with what comes at you. Maybe you get one day you get a big bill in the mail that you weren't expecting when you're tight on money and you face it gracefully or you deal with a medical stressor without panicking and venting or taking your stress out on someone else. Um, and it just might have to do with, with doing things in advance to better prepare yourself. And so I, I don't want people to ever think that their ability to cope with stress is fixed. If anything, I think there's a lot that we can change. And I, I think the X factor is less of a innate or intrinsic superpower and more about our ability to be willing and skillful. And these are the things that, that we can certainly learn. And the kind of one of the first steps to being more willing is seeing if you tend to approach life with kind of a hell no, um, the, kind of the opposite of saying hell yes, or radically accepting what is. Do you make a distinction between stress and trauma? Or is that just depending on how people use the words? Trauma is a very specific kind of stressor. And having faced a life-threatening event that continues to haunt you, whether that is leaving you hypervigilant or re-experiencing the trauma or compromising your sleep, that affects your day-to-day -day ability to cope. Um, but I want people to know, I think this is so important for people to think about, is, is that trauma, even if you've been through something really horrific, there are treatments today that improve your that improve post-traumatic stress. And some of these things are relatively quick. And so I've even worked with clients that have had horrific experiences like sexual trauma in childhood, that there's a there's a newer treatment where you write about the traumatic event in over a number of weeks in a lot of detail. And remarkably, it's called written exposure therapy. And remarkably, people that participate in written exposure therapy. There have been studies with veterans and, and other sorts of uh, populations that are exposed to a lot of trauma. They, their symptoms of PTSD improve, and this only takes five weeks, and it's not anything outside of you. It's, it's your willingness to sit and go through it. And a problem with trauma is that oftentimes we are... Because when a traumatic event happens, we store it in a splintered fashion and writing about it and processing it allows us to store it properly so it's not continuously haunting us. But um, trauma is a particular kind of stress. And it, if you've been through something traumatic, you deserve the opportunity to reclaim your resilience. And there are certainly treatments that can help you do so. Mm -hmm. I asked the question because when I first began reading about um, different interpretations of stress and different understandings, you know, uh, people would be writing into this particular forum and saying, well, I don't understand, like, the idea of agency or, or resource. My house just got swept away, you know, and in a flood or, or you know, some terrible, terrible thing just happened. And uh, the response sometimes would be, well, that I would call that trauma and not stress. And so, uh, I, I've just been curious. And of course, it, a lot does depend on how one uses the words. Right. And if something really terrible happened to you, my message is really, that is so terrible and I'm so sorry. Truly, that is awful and no one should have to go through that. And also, how can we not make things worse? How can we not mm -hmm. make the very upsetting thing happen with losing your house, affect your relationships with your support group or affect your ability to remain gainfully employed and uh, affect your sleep. And so there are, I, I think the biggest thing that we need to realize is that really bad things can happen to us and we can improve exponentially how we live with them by knowing how to put them down and react in ways that are more effective. So maybe you can uh, talk about how Recent, recent research is depicting how stress affects us, like a big burden of stress. Yeah, I mean, this is so fascinating, but in a study 
this is a, some, something that I talk a lot about, um, how we view stress. And so in a study looking at more than 28,000 people, Dr. Abiola Keller, who's a researcher, um, found that people who had both high levels of stress and who believed that stress was bad for them, they were at risk of higher uh, premature mortality by 43%. And so worrying about stress doesn't prevent it. It actually escalates it. And so if you have high levels of stress and think it's okay, I'm not going to stress about my stress, or this is really, really hard, and I'm not going to make things harder for myself, you're going to have much more health and ability to move forward than worrying, oh my gosh, I'm killing myself with the level of stress that I'm experiencing. Of course, I don't want anyone to think that they should take on stress that they don't need to take on, but judging your stress is just creating a stress snowball. Mm -hmm. That's a good phrase, a stress snowball. Yeah, that's my goal. My goal is to prevent the snowballing and the spiraling because, yeah, there's stress is something that we can't necessarily avoid, but we can avoid the cascade and the tornado. Well, of course, we do both. We silo and we snowball. So now I'm getting an image of this giant snowball <laughs> in, a, in a locked room, you know, like, but it's not melting somehow. <laughs> it's not exactly. there. And Jen, this is such a small, silly story, but... Um, before writing this book, we had this one morning in my house where my husband was tired and rushing and he started pouring a gallon of milk and he spilled like a lot of the gallon of milk on the floor. And he was in a huge rush and starts cleaning it up very quickly and aggressively. And he ends up cutting his hand on the kick plate mm. at the bottom of our refrigerator. And you know, first the spilled milk and then he cuts his hand. And then to make matters that much worse, he, we didn't have any bandages and he ran to the drugstore to pick up a bandage and you, you can't make this stuff up, but he got into a minor car accident on the oh, way no. home because he was <laughs> so busy replaying his horrible, terrible bad day. And, and, and so again, like so much of life is much more than spilled milk, but how do we prevent what is spilled milk, staying spilled milk, and what is more significant from turning into something even more stressful? Well, you know, clearly that idea of agency is meant to be empowering. Like, wow, we can, you know, we can have input into this and, and life can be more creative and uh, not just, you know, being dictated by the circumstances we find ourselves in. So that idea, you know, of course, for me was born when my meditation practice was born. Um, and I'm very curious about your experience of offering that idea and how much people see it as empowering or if it seems a little startling. There's a line that is an assumption that the therapists that practice the approach that I do called dialectical behavior therapy. This is like in the therapist kind of guidebook that I think is such a powerful way to think of this, which is you may not have caused all your problems but you have to solve them anyway. And so I think for people, especially people looking for help to realize that it, a lot of your struggles are not your fault, but what are the costs and benefits of staying stuck versus choosing to do something different, even if it feels like a stretch? I'd love to hear what the impetus was for the book. You call it a recipe book for well-being. So how did it come into being? A few things inspired me to write this book. One of them is seeing so many people, over 30 million Americans to be specific, rely on benzodiazepines, anti-anxiety medications like Xanax and Clonopin that make us very sedated and also over long-term use run the risk of leading to cognitive decline. And it just breaks my heart that people become dependent on something outside of themselves. And it also seems so ironic that when we need to be our sharpest, a lot of people feel like they need to take something that actually really dulls their smarts and makes them feel very sedated. So this has been something that's really broken my heart for a very long time. And then during the peak of the pandemic, a colleague of mine happened to mention that there was a study that he saw that found that remarkably patients who were going into surgery 
half of the patients were offered a benzodiazepine and medication like Xanax or Clonabin, and half had the chance to listen to a song. And remarkably, the song had almost the same anxiolytic properties as the medicine. And obviously, songs have no side effects. And so this got me thinking about all of the ways that we can quickly reset how we feel and improve moments that don't do any damage long term or short term. And I wanted to expand on that and uh, also introduce how people can create a life that isn't just swinging from crisis to crisis. And so many people just want clear instructions on what do I do in this hard time? I don't want to read a lot. I just want almost a rule book or instruction manual. And so I I wanted to write something that tells you, you know, when to do something, how exactly to do it, and why why it might help you. Um, so you don't have to do a deep dive or do some or you know do something impulsive, but you can do something at your fingertips that might work as well as, as something that has that has much more downside and risk. Well, let's talk about the stress cycle, as you call it in the book, which, as I understand it, it's. Uh, the way I'm using stress dynamic in a way, it's the ways we habitually respond to stress that actually have the potential to make things worse. So the stress cycle is when we face something stressful, then we get lost in negative thoughts. Negative thoughts obviously create physical sensations of stress, and then we can quickly start to judge those sensations. And then it's understandable if you're thinking bad thoughts and feeling really physically uncomfortable to then cope by avoiding or doing things like procrastinating or resorting to quick fixes like buying something expensive or ordering food that isn't aligned with your health goals. And so if you think about it, something like, um, you know, if you tried to go to sleep because you have an important meeting the next day, if you start thinking, I have to fall asleep right now, while you're also thinking about all the bad things that happened to you earlier today, easily you could start to feel really restless and maybe your heart starts to race and then maybe you start picking up your phone and none of this is conducive to falling asleep easily or quickly or if you have a big project at work you know starting to think this has to be perfect or it's you know it's going to be humiliating easily leads to you know maybe your muscles start to tighten and you feel like you can hardly take a deep breath and then maybe you start procrastinating and all of these things make our stress so much worse. Whereas if we you know, have the mindset of like, it's okay, I'll sleep when I sleep and not a big deal if I am a little tired tomorrow and I can systematically relax my body and I can do things besides pick up my phone, which is going to keep me up, or I can approach the thing that's really hard and there's enough space in me to approach the work task that feels really dreadful. Those things all prevent us from increasing stress, you know, at least threefold. Well, actually, unfortunately, I don't have to wake up early tomorrow morning. I already thought of that when you started the example. I thought, <laughs> huh, do I have to get up early tomorrow morning? <laughs> Which is not my natural rhythm in life anyway. Um, so there's a different kind of cycle that is potential where we're not habitually responding to stress in a way that is making things worse, but actually making things better or work more workable or less lonely as we face some challenge. So the start of the book, you encourage readers to accept and embrace stress, even befriending it. You say all of us can use stress to evolve and grow despite its terrible reputation. So can you speak to that? Yeah, well, if you think about it, a life with no stress would be really detached, really boring, no responsibilities no challenges. And so again, I don't want people to think that injustices or pains that they're facing, they should embrace and, and try to find the good in them. But I think to find a sense of appreciation that you have stress because stress is the price of a meaningful life. And, you know, a funny thing happened recently. I had to get my TB test um, at UCLA and I where the TB testing location is, is right near where all these medical school students were studying for exams. I just looked at them with a sense of both empathy and excitement for them. Like it, it's so stressful to be studying for really hard exams, but also you're on the path to doing something really meaningful that you've probably been wanting to do for a long time that's going to touch so many lives. And so 
if we see stress as something that we can manage and that our body's physical experience of stress is something that is helping us, you know, in studies where people are told that the knots in their stomach are actually, they, they learn to see them as bows. It means that you're, you know, you're actually doing well. If your stomach is tensing up, that means your body is preparing you to focus and it's a sign that you're thriving on your test. Um, people that are taught that actually do perform better. So if we can, can stop judging stress, realize their tools to create exit strategies from unnecessary stress, we can lean into life opportunities that are really meaningful because a lot of people choose to avoid stress in the short term in ways that create stress in the long term, like avoiding new opportunities because they fear rejection rather than leaning into them, seeing that it's much more stressful and depressing to live a small life. Well, it occurs to me also that there might be a, like a preliminary step if you can't get quite to appreciation, you can get to a kind of acceptance rather than protesting and feeling embittered and, um, you know, projecting a sense of permanence, like this is the way things are going to feel forever. Um, and so there's, there's steps along the way uh, that help us, I think, not have a sense of uh, kind of perfectionism or over-idealism. Like I, I remember... Uh, this quotation from Roshi John Halifax, which I've used quite a lot in different writing, um, where she said something like, in this case, she was talking about more like trauma, but she said, uh, basically, don't try to force yourself to think of the traumas of your life as a gift. They're givens. You know, this, this is this is what's happening. This is this is the circumstance of of the present or the past, and rather than you know, there's something in us, I think, that could so easily even be fighting that acknowledgement. Like, no, it's not, it didn't happen that way. It couldn't have, you know. And, but when we actually come to, yes, then that could be the beginning of an arc that becomes uh, also about finding, for some people, you know, it is finding the gift within. I love that. I really do. And I, and I also just want to say acceptance is totally in line with what I'm saying. I think so often people have such a stigmatized relationship with stress that people encourage, you know, optimizing stress and taking it in a different direction just to overcorrect some of the negativity mm -hmm. bias around it. But it, certainly acceptance is, is what we're after and you don't need to like it or love it, but, but really learn to accept because that, again, prevents this cycle of if you accept the current moment, you're not adding on more negativity and catastrophizing. If you accept your body, you're not making it rev up further. And if you accept what is, you're not going to cope in ways that, that haunt you. So acceptance is that the ideal. And that's certainly something I talk a lot mm -hmm. about. So as part of uh, what you write about acknowledgement and acceptance, you introduce the idea of an arc of emotions, uh, ARC being an acronym for antecedent, which is a prompting event, your response, including thoughts, physical sensations and behaviors and consequences both short-term and long-term. So this is kind of like mapping out the emotional experience, correct? And why is this helpful to put into use? Exactly. So we have an arc of our emotions and a lot of people feel like their emotions are overwhelming and all-consuming. And once they start, they can't stop. But if we understand kind of the building blocks of our emotions, we can see how to change them at different points. And... I want people to realize that s managing our emotions and managing stress are pretty similar. And so when we know how to manage our emotions, we're more able to manage stress and vice versa. And being able to see, you know, there's something that happens and then our response, our thoughts, and again, our physical sensations and behaviors all come together. And so it's not like sadness just overcomes you and takes over you, but your thoughts are playing a role. Your behaviors are certainly playing a role how you feel physically is playing a role. And, and this gives us a lot of information on different points. We can create exit strategies by bringing our attention into the present and changing our behaviors. And so learning to manage our emotions is essential for managing stress. And stress is so interesting to me because if you can manage stress, you reduce the risk of falling into longer term problems like anxiety and depression and 
one of the ways to manage stress is uh, um, really understanding kind of the, what is happening as it's unfolding rather than, again, just being consumed. You know, I'm thinking about it in terms of the Buddhist psychology right now, which is very consonant in the sense of um, rather than seeing something as a kind of concrete entity, you know, fixed or uh, reified in some way, you see that it's causes and conditions coming together. So uh, my Burmese meditation teacher, Saito Upandita, used to use this example a lot. It was, it was a little bit uh, difficult to get, you know, through the translation and all that. But um, it is basically saying if you're a physician, uh, you're not thinking about getting rid of the disease. You're thinking about changing the elements that help support or produce that disease. So maybe it's the temperature in the body or you know, uh, whatever it might be, it's many causes and conditions coming together to produce this effect. And the effect is what is our lived experience. But if we want to think about really resolving it in some way, we have to look at causes and conditions because uh, those are the building blocks of what what we're going through in some way. Does that make sense? I love that. And I'll say it in, in a much more um, less eloquent way, but I think our emotions and our stress is a lot like Play-Doh. It's not cement. It's it's something that we can morph and it's malleable. We just need to know what the tools are and and no one should have to go to graduate school in psychology to know some of these tools or no one should have to just live, live in a meditation center to be able to implement some of these. And I'm thinking about both the role of mindfulness and also... Uh, community mindfulness in the sense of sometimes, you know, those like catastrophizing thoughts. Um, you know, I will only feel this for the rest of my life, this one thing, this one terrible thing. Or um, this is all my fault, you know, I should have started therapy 15 years earlier. Or, uh, you know, so a lot of blame or a lot of shame. Sometimes those add-ons are are the most painful thing of all but we don't necessarily catch them until we can see our thoughts at the time we're thinking, you know, not like after we've made the panicked phone call, something like that. But as the panic is beginning and we can see we're in a certain state and then make, have a choice about, do I want to call my child, you know, again, even though they didn't pick up the phone or do I want to let this go for five minutes or something? Exactly. Seeing our thoughts and also seeing our feelings because all our, our emotions tend to be magnets for certain thoughts that correlate with them. Oh, even just seeing I'm, I'm really panicked. Of course, my thinking is, is really anxiety driven rather than taking it very seriously and continuing to act on it. You know, I think I take the example a lot of my friend, uh, colleague Sylvia Borstein, who describes herself as a recovering catastrophizer. And uh, I use that example in part because she says, uh, I would be the kind of person who would call my adult children, one of my adult children, they didn't answer the phone. So, of course, I thought the worst had happened. You know, it never occurs to me that they might be taking a shower <laughs> or, you know, maybe they found love. They don't feel like talking to their mother. <laughs> you know, it must, and of course, sometimes, you know, life can be really hard and sometimes the worst does happen, but not like every time, mm-hmm. you know, and not like it's a kind of prepared script for every, you know, missed phone call because then you're just, you're nervous all the time. And, and she was really suffering in many ways, you know, uh, and that's why she got interested in meditation practice. So in talking to her not too long ago, she said, um, I have a new mantra. And I said, what is it? And she said, uh, not every bus will end up in a ditch. <laughs> You know, instead of the thing we might normally say, like, oh, no, it's going to be the worst. It is the worst. You know, and so being able to see that, the thoughts and the emotions, seems to me really critical. And I so relate to being someone that I, like Sylvia, was such a worrier, ruminator. We played anything that happened and focused on what I did wrong and um, certainly anxious. But a lot of the skills that I learned in training as a mindfulness-based behavioral therapist really changed my life. And so many of the tools I've learned from you have really changed my life. And, and 
these are things that can change anyone's life. It's it's wonderful. And I also think about community in that sense, because uh, for me, one of the most haunting thoughts I would have in response to some challenge or difficulty would be, it's just me. You know, I'm the only one. No one else can really understand. And, uh, and that thought can be really strong, you know, and, and take over and just even being able to remember or be reminded, uh, you know, by a friend, by a therapist, by somebody you're not so alone. You know, this is part of the human condition can be an enormous help. I love that. So you have different sections in the book about dealing with stress in intense moments with stress resets and then in quieter times, what you call stress buffers. So can you explain your different approach to these different times and how to know what's needed and when? Absolutely. So stress resets, it's almost like urgent care, like what to do in it, to triage if you're really struggling in an intense moment, what to do to quickly make things better. And I include resets for your mind, for your body and for your behavior. And then stress buffers are almost like preventative medicine, what to do before stress comes up to help you cope better. And so one small example is a lot of people are afraid of their physical sensations of anxiety and truly practicing welcoming physical sensations of anxiety. Say you have you know panic attacks that make you feel like you can't breathe. If you practice hyperventilating for a minute over time, like a couple times, let's say three, three nights in a row, that's an incredible buffer that when it shows up unexpectedly, you're you sort of have the attitude of you put out a welcome mat rather than it, you see it as, as terrifying. And of course you wouldn't want to do that in, when you're already panicking. And so that's kind of the difference, what to do preemptively to better prepare you and what to do in the heat of the moment to quickly help you recalibrate. You have uh, different sections talking about these stress resets. And I know, Listeners would like to walk away from this conversation with some concrete tools for handling stress differently in acute times. So can you share some of these stress resets for the listeners? Absolutely. And there, there are so many. And so I just want people to know that different things work at different times for different people. I'm just going to share some of my personal favorites. So one reset that we sort of touched on is really appreciating that emotions come in waves because it is so easy when things are really difficult to think, like you mentioned, this is going to last forever or to get sad about being sad or anxious about being anxious. This is going to go on and ruin things. And and to really um, repeatedly think to yourself, emotions come in waves. Emotions really don't last very long. If we're able to stay present with them, they they really spike when we start to add thoughts and act on them. But if we can take a step back and realize that we're all pretty terrible at predicting how we'll feel in the future. And if we can just allow what is without trying to jump to the future, it it really is very temporary. Another reset that I really like is coherent breathing, which is breathing in, let's say for five seconds and breathing out for five seconds. So you would gently close your lips and inhale for five and exhale for five. And this really dramatically slows our rate of respiration. And remarkably, this creates like a nice kind of calm alertness. And I was really struck in doing research for the book that people are even practicing this with individuals who are in disaster zones, who are surviving disasters and learning to slowed their bodies down is allowing them to cope with really horrific experiences. And we've, and um, this is just a nice testament to how even if circumstances aren't changing, we can, we can recalibrate from within. So those are just a couple, but there are, are so, so many. And, um, and a lot of these take kind of stacking, like doing a bunch of them together. I also should say, just because I'm here and I'm so grateful to you, that loving kindness is, is such a powerful, <laughs> is such a powerful one, um, and that's one that I'm always teaching and um, 
teaching my clients and also writing about because I think that is such a powerful quick reset. If you're about to go into a party and you feel nervous, may I be happy, may I be healthy, may I be safe, may I live with ease is so different than, oh my gosh, what if I have no one to talk to and clinging to your phone and that creates a negative cycle of not having no one to talk to. That's or if you're beating yourself up to for a mistake, quickly doing that is such an incredible way to change the channel in, in a matter of minutes. I'm so glad that you do that, that you teach that. Um, I also like the term stress buffer because it's such a great visual. And I wonder if it's also connected to what I was talking about before, like causes and conditions. Like if you I do have to get up early in the morning for a meeting, but you're a terrible night owl and you have, let's just say you have awful sleep hygiene. You grab your iPhone when you get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, and then you're up for a long time, you know, instead of going back to sleep. And uh, maybe we need to look at kind of just general habits and patterns that are going to feed into feeling overwhelmed. Exactly. And there's so many stress buffers and a lot of us need a lot of them. Um, because life can be difficult, but it, again, it's going to be really, really hard to cope with hard times effectively if you're sleep deprived or if you're using substances that aren't serving you or if you're really lonely. And so preemptively doing things like creating a schedule that includes opportunities to do things that give you a sense of pleasure, do things that align with your sense of purpose, connect you with people. I mean, these things seem quite simple, but remarkably people that are moderately to severely depressed that use apps that coach them to do a bit more and track their mood behavioral activation getting more active does affect us to the same degree that antidepressants would and so creating a really kind of an antidepressant lifestyle is what I want to help people do because it's it's not fair to um, not live well and then expect to cope gracefully with something really hard that comes up, we really need to do preventative medicine. That's lovely. So you close the book uh, again with the idea that stress can be an opportunity. So I wonder if you could say a little more about that. Yeah. So at, at any moment, and again, I don't want to glorify stress, but at any moment we have the choice. Do we want to create what I think of as a virtuous cycle or a positive cycle or do we want to fall into a vicious cycle where we're just being overcome by our thoughts and feelings and we're not really driving our lives? And if we think about the people that have most inspired us, I'm guessing they're people that have really coped with adversity in ways that are really intentional and aligned with their values and very small things at any moment. We can turn the mind to increase our acceptance be kind to someone when we're really struggling within. Um, to, yeah, do something to change things both for ourselves and the people around us. And again, I think people that are stressed feel like, oh my gosh, I can't do anything more. But very small things can make a very profound difference. Um, I talk uh, in the chapter, my final chapter about stress as an opportunity about a client that I met that went to the bookstore. You know, he was very stressed and struggling with substance abuse and his mental health and going to the bookstore allowed him an opportunity to learn something and escape some of his triggers. And I, I want people to realize that at any moment we can do things that allow us to live according to our values. And the real test of our inner strength is how we cope with hard times. And, and I want people to also realize that peace of mind isn't life feeling easy. It's knowing that we can cope regardless of what shows up in our lives. Thank you. And before we finish, I would love for you to lead us in a practice to bring our conversation to a close. Thank you. Um, and it's funny, one of the skills that I talk about in the book is opposite action, which is doing the opposite of um, what your emotion wants you to do, especially if your emotion's not justified, which is one of my favorite skills. And I, I feel like, oh my gosh, I can't, how can I lead my meditation teacher in a meditation? But I am honored to do so. <laughs> um, I'm so honored to do so. So a practice that I would love to lead people through is one that nicely wraps up a lot of the concepts that we've been talking about. And so again, rumination is such a 
problematic habit. And it's really hard to just stop ruminating if you don't have a little bit of practice stretching and getting familiar with where your mind is going in more quiet times. And so I'm going to lead us through a mindfulness practice that's included in a workbook called the Unified Protocol. And the Unified Protocol is really interesting. It helps people who might struggle with many things. Let's say someone has depression, social anxiety, general anxiety, panic. They might worry, oh no, I'm going to be in therapy for a really long time and it's going to be a lot. Um, But remarkably learning one set of skills over 10 to 12 weeks across the board because the same processes affect us in different ways, regardless of what we're struggling with, helps people cope, uh, cope across a whole host of issues. And so this is a meditation from the Unified Protocol. Um, so I, I know it's also so easy when you're listening to a podcast to be multitasking. So I invite you, if it's possible, to um, try to find a quiet spot and join us. Um, I would love for you to close your eyes if that's comfortable and get settled in your chair. You can begin by turning your attention to yourself in the room. Picture yourself in this space and start to take note of the places where you're coming into contact with it. Perhaps notice how it feels to be sitting in the chair, the sensations of the floor meeting your feet, or the pressure of your hands on your lap. Take a moment to ground yourself in the here and now by connecting to the room. Now bring your focus to the experience of your own breathing. Notice what your breathing feels like in your chest or diaphragm, in your mouth and nose. Focus on your breathing as it is happening right now, using your breath to help anchor you to the present moment. Your breath is always with you, so you can use it as a reminder to pay attention to what is happening right now. Pause for a moment and just allow yourself to notice your breath. Now expand your attention to notice any physical sensations you're experiencing. Pause for a moment and just allow yourself to observe any sensations in your body without judging them as good or bad or trying to change them in any way. Simply notice what is there with openness and curiosity. Next, bring your attention to your thoughts. Notice how your thoughts may shift from one topic to the next. Some thoughts may pass by quickly. Others may distract you. And some of them may be very hard to let go of. Simply notice what you're thinking without trying to force a particular topic into awareness or push away another. Try not to judge your experience as bad or good. If you notice yourself getting caught up in or carried away by a thought, just acknowledge it and gently bring your attention back to observing your thoughts as they occur. Allow yourself to watch your thoughts for a few moments. Now start to shift your focus to explore how you're feeling. Emotions, just like thoughts, can fluctuate. In the course of a short period, you might feel anxious and then calm, angry and then loving, or sad and then joyful. Emotions come in waves, rising in intensity, only to come back down. Simply acknowledge how you're feeling in this very moment, without trying to change your experience. Allow yourself to observe your emotions without judgment. Notice how they ebb and flow. Now continue to take note of your entire experience, how your body feels, what you are thinking, any emotions that are coming up. If you notice that you're trying to change your experience in some way, take note of that and gently guide yourself back to simply observing. If you get caught up in a particular sensation, thought, or emotion, use your breath to anchor you back to the present moment. Then return to the process of noticing your experience. 
When you are ready, start to bring yourself back into the room. Picture yourself sitting in this room. Become aware of the places you're coming into contact with it. You can wiggle your fingers and toes, and when you're ready, open your eyes. Oh, thank you so much. It was really beautiful. Of course. And again, this is from the Unified Protocol, and it's also very similar to the three-minute breathing space and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And I love this because it really walks us through the different components of our emotions or of our stress response and gives us an opportunity to practice a little bit more acceptance and willingness and coming back to, to being skillful in the moment. It's great. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you so much for joining me. Thank you, Sharon. I, I really can't thank you enough. And I, uh, I was loving it listening to you on the Maya Bialik podcast. And I forget <laughs> she called you, um, I think she called you like our spiritual mother. And I, I really feel that. She's so sweet. Very much. And I can relate to that. So I want to thank you Aww. so much for all that you're doing in your work. And I feel so honored to have you as a mentor and a friend. Well, thank you. And congratulations again on the book. I think it will really help a lot of people. And to the listeners, you can get a copy of Stress Resets in paperback, ebook, or audiobook wherever books are sold. And I also want to mention that a percentage of profits from this book are being donated to the Ark of the United States, Breath Body Mind Foundation, and Second Nurture. Take care. Hey folks, thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about Jenny's work or to get a copy of her new book, Stress Resets, you can visit her website at drjennytates.com. That's D-R-J-E-N-N-Y-T-A-I-T-Z.com. For all things Sharon, including a whole slew of upcoming virtual events, or a free guided meditation, you can visit SharonSalzberg.com. This has been the Meta Hour podcast, brought to you by the Be Here Now Network. May you be safe, may you be happy, may you be healthy, and may you live with ease.